to finish today, we have a real treat. So if you came along to Web Directions a couple of years ago, the very last time we were in the convention center, we had this next speaker as uh, one of our keynote speakers and tremendously popular, perhaps, perhaps certainly one of the most popular speakers we've ever had. Uh, <laughs> I've practiced it so much. Segwalski, I, I practice so much. Maciej Segwalski. <laughs> Maciej Segwalski is our closing keynote speaker for today. He, he writes beautifully and brilliantly in a funny and, and honest and challenging way. So if you haven't uh, gone and read anything he has, just go and follow him as Bacon Meteor on Twitter and just follow his writing. He's just had a Kickstarter project to get sent off on a five-week tour to Antarctica with a whole lot of, woo how cool is that? Uh, with a whole lot of people spending a lot of money to spend five weeks on a Russian kind of ship that's going to depart to Antarctica most people don't go. And he's going to write about it. So if you haven't Kickstarted that, uh, you should get on board anyway. Um, he runs, he, and he's the sole employee and does all the work at a company called Pinboard, which kind of harks back, I guess, to the, the old school days of, of the first generation of web applications a decade or more ago. He's worked at many of the, uh, that's called Pinboard, uh, and he's worked at Yahoo and many other Silicon Valley uh, companies over the years. He brings a very, very unique, honest, and very funny perspective to our industry. And he's going to talk about something that I've been thinking a lot about this year, and I guess a lot of us have, as the amount of uh, the size of our web pages grows and grows and grows. He's going to talk about our web page obesity crisis. So to finish today, uh, Web Directions 2015, would you please welcome, welcome Maciej Tegwalski. Right. Woohoo! <laughs> Thanks, John. I wish I could keep it cool enough to just sit in that chair and like lean back like Gore Vidal and give my talk like that, but I can't do that yet. Maybe next time. I want to stress to you, before I start my ranting, beautiful websites come in all shapes and sizes. I am not here to shame anybody for the amount of bytes, the amount of resources, whatever else. I enjoy a big, juicy JavaScript image gallery. I like javascript -y web apps that are enormous. I watch online videos like the rest of you. I think this stuff is great. That's not what I'm here to talk about at all. I, I'm, I want to talk about this kind of public health crisis of website obesity, where despite everybody's best efforts, wonderful designers who care about the web as much or more than I do are somehow producing pages that just get bigger. I'm going to give examples in this talk because otherwise it would be too abstract and dry. But again, I am not in the game to shame anybody except a few big companies that I will call out that I think are breaking the web. But the individual people working on these projects, I understand, are under big pressures uh, and do this kind of under duress. Uh, by the way, I would love to hear war stories, confidential or not, afterwards. So please come and talk to me. Um, what is the web obesity crisis? Well, here is a page from 2012 on JigaOM that explains the growing epidemic of page bloat. It says that pages are now more than one megabyte in size. The page itself is 1.7 megabytes big. Now, here is a slide from two years later, 2014. Is my audio clipped out? Can, can professionals fix the problem? Can people hear me? <laughs> can people in the back raise their hands if they can hear me speaking? OK, good. Thank you. Uh, so two years later, JigaOM published this follow-up saying that the average web page size is just shy of two megabytes, and the page itself is three megabytes large. So the obesity crisis is this, that if current trends continue, it is very likely that by 2020, articles about web bloat are going to be five megabytes in size or bigger. Uh, the problem. I should never say problem, the opportunity we face <laughs> is that one year's bloated web page becomes next year's normal, and then after that it's an example of parsimonious and elegant web design. This is called defining deviancy down. So we need to anchor ourselves to some sort of a rock. And the rock that I suggested in a recent tweet is this, that your website, if it's a text site, like an article, should not exceed in size the classical works of Russian literature. This was extremely generous of me. I could have chosen French literature, where the novels are very short and kind of pithy, if you've ever read The Stranger or something. I'm choosing Russian literature, these big bricks of solid quality prose. 
All I'm saying is that your articles can be smaller in file size than these. This tweet, for example, is about 900 megabytes, um, sorry, 900 kilobytes in size, which makes it larger than The Master and Margarita, Bulgakov's masterpiece about the devil and his retinue, including a giant cat coming to Moscow in 1937 during the Great Purges, and a parallel story about a weird kind of Jesus who's pursued by Matthew, but who doesn't faithfully record the gospel but makes stuff up. It's a great book, and I encourage you to read it. It's a great tweet, and you've probably already read it. All I'm saying is they shouldn't be the same size. <laughs> Here is an article on medium.com, my new favorite website, having researched this talk, about bloat. This is a 400-word article, and somehow it manages to be 1.6 megabytes, all told. About half of that JavaScript. This makes it, in fact, longer than crime and punishment. <laughs> crime and punishment, you may recall, is Dostoevsky's psychological thriller about a Russian student who's impoverished and decides to prove his Napoleonic, ubermensch sort of quality by axing the evil moneylender and stealing all her money. In his haste, he also kills her innocent half-sister, doesn't take the money, and is pursued for the rest of the book by a devious prosecutor, Porfiry Pietrovich, who kind of spins him around his finger. It's a great book. It's about a little bit shorter than that medium post. That shouldn't be happening. Here is a post on something called Yada, about web page sizes. It's an entire history of them through, uh, through 2015, and includes a quote that heavy pages tend to be slow pages, and slow pages mean unhappy users. This evocative quote may remind you of the opening lines of Anna Karenina, which says that all happy families are alike, but all unhappy families are unhappy in their own way. But this would be a false comparison, because Anna Karenina is only about 1.8 megabytes long. The real <laughs> The real book to compare it to is War and Peace at about three megabytes. War and Peace is Tolstoy's meditation on whether the forces of history propel us helpless through the river of time or whether individual men and women can affect these great changes by themselves. One article that does not address these themes at all is this one in the Yorkshire Evening Post. And I feel sorry for picking on the poor person who designed this page. But it's a, I'll read the title to you, Confusion Cuisine, Leeds Hospital Bosses Apologize After Curry and Crumble Are Served on the Same Plate. <laughs> this article may make you think of a different writer, Proust, who ate a madeleine dipped in tea, and it opened up an extended meditation on the nature of time and memory that three megabytes later wraps up with the realization that time is really an illusion. But that's not the case. Unfortunately, the Confusion Cuisine article is quite a bit longer. The JavaScript is almost as long as the Proust novel. There's two megabytes of it, and the whole thing clocks in at 40 megabytes big. Yeah, I know, I know. As one of my first of many unscripted parenthetical asides, it would be cool if browsers showed this somehow. Maybe like if they dropped down and you had to lift them back up because of the page weight. But it would be great if something other than dev tools gave you an intuitive sense of just how big, and especially on mobile devices, uh, maybe the sides could bubble out or something. I'm your designers, so please think of like a cool visual effect that could achieve this. Here is a page about best practices for increasing website performance. One easy best practice is to not make it three megabytes big. Uh, <laughs> this, one, this next one is very mean, but here is a slideshow by Tim Kodletz, who is otherwise a fantastic writer and presenter about performance issues. But his slide deck on this site is nine megabytes, and you can also download a PDF that is 14 megabytes in size. Here's a page that's, that announces Google Search is now tagging certain pages as slow to load on your mobile device. The page itself is 18 megabytes big, so <laughs> probably it got a tag on its own. Um. So these articles show that everybody is very aware that there is a problem. Facebook has proposed one solution. How many of you have heard of this Instant Articles initiative? Uh, I see some hands going up. Instant articles are this idea where you have a simplified version of your uh, news stories that then get published on Facebook within the Facebook site itself and through caching and other magic and decrufting, they're optimized to load really, really quickly so people can read them fast. Uh, Facebook announced, and, and this person on, this is the page they announced it on, this is just the head of National Geographic's photo division. He's really excited because on instant articles you can pan your mobile phone around and the photo will pan with it because everybody wants that, like you want to keep your phone completely steady or the photo is going to start moving. But, 
Facebook chose to announce this on... <laughs> I'm going to be laughing a lot in this, so please excuse me. On a 6.8 megabyte site whose only real substance is a link to a 41 megabyte video. Right? <laughs> this is the equivalent of making an exercise video where you don't even bother to exercise, you just stand there eating pizza and biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> like, there's a deep, deep contempt for, for the web in this initiative. Uh, but Facebook found a way to make it even better. They have this very sanctimonious project called internet.org where they tell you how most of the world can't get online or gets online through terrible connectivity and how they want to change this. You're going to say to me, Mache, it's not possible that this globe is a giant movie that just spins around and is 16 megabytes in size. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, it is. <laughs> it's just going to keep spinning and that's, you know, that's the level, that's what we're up against even on the pages that are supposed to pretend, broadcast a tiny amount of caring about this problem, nobody cares. And it's true, it's true that there is really bad internet connectivity in all sorts of places, not just in the expected ones, like parts of the third world, but even here in Australia. When I came here, I was given this magic box with three gigabytes of data. Unfortunately, I'm researching a web obesity talk, <laughs> so it's almost <laughs> empty right now. But I've traveled, I've traveled elsewhere in, uh, in, in Australia, in northern Queensland. I've traveled in the South Island of New Zealand. I remember they treat the internet there like rare hundred-year-old brandy. Like, <laughs> in theory, you can have as much of it as you want, but it's really expensive. And by the time you go back the third or fourth time, they're looking at you funny. Like, you know, you want another 100 megabyte shit? Like, what is wrong with you? And this isn't confined just to the hinterlands or, or, or countryside. Everybody's had the experience of being somewhere where you just have terrible mobile connectivity and you're down to your last bit of battery and a page is happily loading that wants to show you a video and has all sorts of templating JavaScript so that it burns through it. And it's a horrible, horrible feeling. I propose this solution. Designers who make pages like this should be forced to use the Apple hockey puck mouse for the remainder of their careers. If you're too old to remember this, this is a perfectly circular mouse where you could not figure out where the button was unless, <laughs> until you, unless you looked at it. And it's kind of the perfect torture tool for people uh, who are Apple fans and who, uh, who, who use the mouse a lot for their work. Google has seen what Facebook is doing and decided that it needs its own initiative. It has announced the Accelerated Mobile Pages Project. I'm sure you know where this is going. The Accelerated Mobile Pages Project page is theoretically infinite in size. As Jeremy Keith pointed out, when you load this, the carousel that plays for no reason on this mobile phone just gets loaded over and over and over again. This will be hard to see, but this is this timeline where you see a Morse code-like series of dashes up top is the same 3.4 megabyte video being relentlessly downloaded again and again and again. If you open this page in Safari where that carousel is broken, you will see that it's only four megabytes in size most of it. I think my audio cut out again or else it just feels nicer to talk. Can people still hear me? Hands in the back, okay, good. If you can't hear me, just imagine I'm saying really funny things and kind of go with the slides. Uh, so Jeremy Keith and I were lucky enough to have a Twitter interaction with the technical lead of this Google project where he explained that the reason the advanced mobile pages page was enormously bloated was limited resources and outsourcing. This moved me. This moved me profoundly. <laughs> For all we talk about Google being a huge company and doing all sorts of things that make the web worse, running ad networks, they are up against it. They can't even afford to make a small responsive website for one of their flagship projects. So out of the goodness of my heart, I spent a couple of hours, read up on media queries, and I redesigned their page for them, replacing these slide carousels with pictures of William Howard Taft. <laughs> William Howard Taft is America's greatest president by volume, and he is a really <laughs> handsome looking fellow. So I put him in the slide carousels, and I was able to get this page down from its original size of four megabytes plus infinity, to about half a megabyte. That's not a big achievement. I'm sure you could do better, but it's something. I've offered it to them for their own personal use for free, but they really must be having problems. They can't even copy it over to their site. So I'm, I'm, anybody from Google in the audience, I'm more than willing to help make this a reality. And this leads me to propose a further design maxim. I call it the Taft test. If 
the images on your site look better with William Howard Taft instead of what was originally there, maybe they're not necessary to the design. And if you do want to leave them in, leave Taft. He's a fun guy to look at. I don't know if it's the mustache, if it's his, his fur coats, but he's just a genuinely friendly fellow to see. The idea that sending a, a compact web page is something that requires effort beyond and above the regular crap page baffles me. I have a very simple suggestion for how to make your pages perform you know, like, uh, uh, like something that performs well. Analogies escape me. Simply do a, a two-step thing. Right? First, send down only the content that is most essential, that has to be there for your user, and second, stop. Don't do anything more, <laughs> because you've already sent what they need by definition. Why do you then need to send them stuff that by definition they don't need? Have courage in your minimalism. I'm going to channel a famous motivational speaker for a second. I can go out there tonight, tonight, and in two hours make all these pages load in under a second. Every page that I've shown you so far. Can you? Can you? The answer is, of course you can. You're designers. I'm not even a designer. It's not hard. We knew how to do this back in 2002, how to make small web pages. It's not like the secret to Damascus steel that has been forgotten and archaeologists are searching for it, but something is preventing us from doing it. It's very, very odd. I'm a person who has struggled with my weight all my life, so I know all these secrets that people who are trying to lose weight use when you're comparing yourself to how things used to be. You suck your gut in or you know exactly where to stand on the scale, right? So web designers have come up with analogous things, metrics that they use to convince themselves that everything is fine. My favorite one of these is speed index. Who's heard of speed index? Raise your hands, please. Okay, we have, we have quite a few people. Only Google would have the arrogance to just casually throw in an integral sign in explaining speed index. The idea is that the, the user is looking at something and then it loads, and the more of it loads faster, the better it is because it creates the illusion that the site might actually be ready. Of course, the only honest measure of page loading time is from the moment that you click the link or enter the URL until the user has finished closing the final ad on the page. That is the only honest measure if you really look at it. Because all of this speed index stuff you're still hearing the laptop fan whirring like crazy as it loads the 45 megabyte ad down below or where the user is about to scroll. And you also don't know how many other tabs are open that have also completed rendering according to speed indices but are still going strong as far as the resources they pull in. So th there's this fundamental dishonesty. When I argue these questions with performance experts, I feel a little bit like I'm talking to people who drive around in a giant SUV. And they have all these tricks like, if you deflate the left front tire, you can corner faster and it helps your mileage a little bit. Or you fold in the mirrors and then you, you pay less for petrol. Where my fundamental point is like, why are you driving this thing when you're going 200 meters to the store? Just ride a bicycle. But it doesn't, it doesn't get through. And in fact, I, I'm sounding harsh, but I know that it, for many of you, if you had a client and you presented them with a bicycle solution, say like a 200K web page, you would get fired. Even if it presented all of the ads and, and, and trackers and, and LinkedIn buttons and cruft that they insisted on, you would still get fired because it's not the modern web. So I, I, I empathize with, with, with everybody who has to deal with clients and with this, this climate, and I don't have the answers, but I have the luxury of being up here and being drunk and being able to say whatever I want about it. <laughs> Here's my humble suggestion. This applies to text-based websites, where it's mostly about textual content. Have the web pyramid, where at the base, you want to have text that's worth reading, be the majority of your site. Pass that markup to uh, structure it semantically, do all the good things that markup does. After that, throw in some images, make it pretty, compress them nicely, don't binge, but put some images in there. People like to see them. Add some CSS to make it stylish, do your font things, and as a special treat, a little bit of scripting, just a touch. That's the web pyramid in my fantasies. Here's the web pyramid as I see it in reality. 
as an aside, this is taken from the American dollar bill. I like that our founding fathers were insane enough that they decided uh, a, a pyramid with a hovering eye above it was just the thing to put on our currency, as opposed to you know, a bridge or something. So, uh, so the base of this pyramid, of course, is HTML. The majority of what's out there then is crap. <laughs> and then at the very summit of it, we get surveillance. <laughs> that is the state of the web today. Thank you. Let's talk about something important. Let's talk about really fat ads. Because I, I sense a wave of despair emanating from the audience. You work hard, you care about performance, you minify everything, you do everything you can to make these sites blazingly fast and fairly small, and then you're required to put in ads. It ruins your visual design because they have to go in, in places that ads should never go. And it ruins uh, your page size because they're vast and most importantly, you have absolutely no control over what might show up there. Here is an article from NPR's All Tech Considered. It's very recent. The title is, With Ad Blocking Use on the Rise, What Happens to Online Publishers? This article is 12.4 megabytes in size. If you turn on ad blocking, bing, it goes down to 1.1 megabytes. 12 times smaller. It's still a pretty hefty article, but that is an impressive difference. If you look at what is getting pulled into this article to make it so enormous, it's not just movies and things, it's also a lot of JavaScript. Every share button, every, every widget, every one of those tabula ads that takes you to terrible places on the web, everything comes with its own little suitcase packed full of JavaScript that's utterly opaque and uh, untrustable, frankly. Ads have become the major vector for malware. So you're in this impossible position as designers where you're supposed to make a beautiful web page and then they give you hideous things that get thrown into it at render time, so you never even see it. It just goes straight into the, the template of your design. Advertisers have taken a fancy to this format, which I, I have grown to love. This is even better than word clouds. This is, it's called like something like the marketing landscape. But basically, they just put logos in and then give them weird category names. So this is the marketing tech landscape from 2011 with 100 companies. Here is the one from 2012 that had 350 companies in it. Here is the next one from 2014, now 947 companies. And finally, today in 2015, ad tech has grown to 1,876 companies in this mysterious sector. Advertisers will tell you that it just has to be this way. Online publishing must be supported by advertising, and advertising has to take the form that it does. You have to remember, though, when you're dealing with advertisers, that advertisers are liars. I don't mean this pejoratively. I mean this as a job description. Their job is literally to convince you to do something you would not otherwise choose to do. And one of the things you would not choose to do as designers is to put all this crap in your web pages. But they convince you that the bloat in performance is the price we pay for free content. And if you ask why we can't actually just design the pages with the ads themselves already in place so we exercise some control over the process, I'll try to get back to that point later. One thing to do when you're studying a really complicated system, especially when it's trying to obfuscate itself so it's not understandable, is to look at, like, zoom out at the really big picture. This is a beautiful German slide about the energy balance of the Earth. So you see that from the sun, the rays come down and they get reflected. And you can follow the widths of the arrows and stuff and figure out exactly what the energy budget is, how much the clouds reflect, and so on. So I've done something similar for the ad tech industry. And this is the, the, the political economy part of my talk. Please pay close attention. In a terribly misguided attempt at cultural sensitivity, I have attempted to <laughs> represent the customer as a kangaroo. Uh, so the customer has, uh, has some sort of relationship with a merchant. Uh, he pays money, or as you call it in Australia, dollars, to someone in exchange for goods and services. And everything is normal. Part of that money is deflected into the ad ecosystem. Uh, it's sort of like a little consumption tax on every purchase that you make. This is normal too. The merchant has paid for some advertising. Something has happened to draw your attention to the product. And a portion of your purchase price somehow eventually goes into the pockets of these marketers. As you notice, again, there is an awful lot of them. 
So that's the money going in. How about the money going out? Well, it goes out to several successful ad networks that have managed to make huge profits from the marketing ecosystem. Companies like Facebook, Yahoo, surprisingly enough, and Google. All of these have found ways to make a killing off the advertising market. But if you notice the sizes of the arrows, they don't balance out. The money going in is fairly small compared to the money going out. The missing piece is investors. Investors see this opportunity, this growing uh, set of ad tech companies, and they are pouring money in. And that money helps balance out the, the profits being pulled out of the sector. The problem is this. The opportunity is this, that investors eventually, someday, want to be on the other side of the diagram. They would like to be getting profits that are bigger than the investment they put in. When you look at this, of course, the arrows really, really don't balance out. And what happens next is fairly obvious. In fact, I, I actually believe that this is happening now, that we are seeing the first signs of desperation in the ad tech market, and the symptoms of that desperation being clawing for greater and greater advantages through surveillance over your competitors consolidating data sets between companies, doing everything possible to try to distinguish yourself from all the other fish in the sea. There's a shark, I wish I could remember the name of it, but it has a terrible origin story. It, it's, it's one of the few fish that's live born, but the mama shark has all these baby sharks in her uterus and they all fight with each other and there's only one born at the end because it's the one who's been able to eat all of its siblings. It's a, one of those horrible nature things. But this is exactly what the ad tech industry feels like, is all these little sharks that are attempting to be the last one left so that they can, they can reap the windfall. So what we're gonna see, as I said, is a wave of consolidation, ruthless tracking, people combining databases, and the complete destruction of what remains of our online privacy, unless, like I propose, we regulate the hell out of this system right now. This is the apocalyptic vision of the ad-free future. Um, I've argued that we fundamentally need to ban third-party tracking and third-party ad networks. For you people, it will mean that whatever ads are on your site are ones that you actually designed in. You regain control over the design of it. And we, get, we return to an era of dumb ads. Marketing people will say that this is impossible. We need surveillance or the whole economic basis of the web will come crashing down. But I don't believe that. The surveillance is fairly recent. And when you listen to marketers talk among themselves and read their studies, only something like 10 to 15% of them even say that they're using the data they collect. They're collecting it to, to, to tick a box. You know, oh yes, we have that, we have, uh, we have user tracking. But they're not really using it effectively. And I'm afraid of what happens when they start using it effectively. You may not have noticed, but earlier in my slides, the ads that you were seeing were, th were for things like uh, Qantas Airlines flights to Australia and other stuff that I had just surfed in the incognito window that was being retargeted at me for marketing purposes. So this is you know, incredibly invasive, even in this sandbox situation where I'm researching a talk and I have no cookies and nothing. After three or four casual visits in places, they know a lot about my interests and they want this to continue and I want it to stop. Advertisers will say that there are no alternatives. Micropayments, for example, are dead. Micropayments are an interesting case. This is a graph, I'm sorry that it's not particularly legible, it's from the New York Times recently, where they calculated the cost in bandwidth on a typical American data plan of opening sites in your, in your mobile browser. So Boston.com, for example, costs 32 cents on average to fully download all of the advertising content, and then about eight cents for the stuff that you wanted to read. So we have micropayments implemented and working well. The only problem is they're going to telecommunications companies. They're not going to the publisher. Imagine if on every page load, these sites got a couple of pennies. They could completely remove advertising, be faster, better designed, and they would still be making more money than they are now. But we're told that this is impossible. I think it's just very, very hard. But there's no reason we can't work on it, particularly that we've accidentally implemented it in a way that doesn't help us at all. Of course, the worst thing from a design perspective about advertising is you're told for reasons of performance, put it in last, always put it in last. But these ads, they arrive after the page is rendered, after your speed index tells you that everything is fully finished, and they just kind of elbow their way through your design. They expand, they move, they create an overlay. You have no idea what they're going to do. It's kind of like having a party 
The music is on, everybody's arrived, they're eating snacks, they're starting to dance, and then a salesman barges through the door and says, I'm going to sell some Tupperware, please sit down and take a look. It's a horrible user experience, and it goes against all the instincts that you otherwise use in web design. So what I'm arguing in favor of is not abandoning advertising. What I want is a return to dumb old ads. Again, the ad tech industry says we can't have dumb ads. They will not possibly bring in enough money. But think of the things that dumb advertising paid for in the past. Dumb advertising bought the Batmobile. It was enough to like, create these television shows with enormous sets, with fancy uh, costumes, with Batmobiles, and show them on TV for free, supported by really poorly targeted advertising. And it somehow carried the whole radio industry and the whole television industry. But yet we're told that it's not enough to pay for a designer and a server and a couple of freelance journalists. Freelance journalists will write for peanuts. You and I both know it. The ad industry says, well, of course, dumb advertising would be better if we could put, for example, a camera on your television. Then we could really know how to target things so that they don't waste your time and best meet your expectations and so on. But, you know, I think we've heard quite enough from them. Let's talk about something different. Let's talk about fat assets. This is a problem that has been plaguing us since the beginning of the web. Uh, the idea that we accidentally put things in our pages that are just oversized. Here is a travel blogger's website, ordinarily quite small. This is a person who prides himself on, he's kind of snooty about uh, the direction the web is taking, but here he messed up and he put in a three megabyte image. And because it's on a fast network, he didn't notice until he looked at it at one point on a mobile device. So this is kind of a classic mistake, except it's getting easier and easier to make because we have these networks that have enormous capacity. So you can put stuff on that's megabytes in size and not notice it especially if, like many developers, you have all your script blockers turned on and you're working on a fast network. This is a recent traffic jam in China, which uh, here's 50 lanes of traffic that are completely blocked for six days. The answer we've been offering so far is let's just build like a 51st lane and a 52nd lane, elegantly solving the problem, but it doesn't. It actually makes the thing, uh, congestion worse. Here's another example. Oh, sorry, I forgot to turn the ad blocker on. Okay, here's an example. <laughs> of an article about, an interesting article about Spotify and fake listening traffic, but it has this so-called hero image up top, and it's a, just a picture of a pair of headphones. It happens to be three megabytes large. I understand that the author probably didn't even, had no involvement with this image, this was just put in through the CMS, but it wasn't minified, and so it explodes the entire page. As we develop more complicated tool chains and become really reliant on things being compressed and minified appropriately, these mistakes crop up more and more often, and they're a symptom of complexity and a symptom of bloat. A more interesting example to me is this site. Uh, the article title is Watch Martin O'Malley, who's a no-name candidate for president in America, sing Taylor Swift's Bad Blood on the View. The interesting thing to me about it is that this image, which looks like it was taken with a potato, is captured from a television show and yet is also over a megabyte big, except that if you look at it on Chrome, Chrome is smart enough to talk to the server and request a compression that makes it 100K. So depending on what you're viewing the site through, it looks like it's not huge or it looks like it's really huge. And again, as designers, this is a problem we face more and more. We actually don't know what our site looks like at all because there's a combinatorial explosion of devices, screen sizes, widths, and types of software that are interacting. And on the same page down at the bottom in the area that advertisers charmingly call chum, these these cheap ads, there's an animated GIF that I've circled that is 1.1 megabytes in size. It's bobbleheads on, on some dancers. Again, it's snuck through the entire, whatever quality control process this fine website has. Uh, but there's no, no one more uh, offensive about fat assets than Apple. Uh, I clicked around on the Apple page a lot, looking to see what I could find. And I think it was the iPad Pro iOS 9 explanatory page that won. So I'll try to do this in salesman mode. You know, how big do you think that this page, which has about 10 sentences on it is? Well, you get not only an entire original iMac at 32 megabytes, but you get enough room for the Macintosh SE, eight additional megabytes. And the space shuttle main computer, one megabyte, not just for one space shuttle, for all of them. With enough room left over on this page, this 51 megabyte page, for the entire works of William Shakespeare. So 
I think this is a marketing stunt by Apple. They make these pages so incredibly heavyweight so that you load them with your device. I'm like, man, I can't wait to get one of these Apple iPhones because this is just a terrible, terrible phone I have. Um, I call this approach uh, chicken shit minimalism. Um, this is an article I wrote recently on Medium. Because it's a 50-minute talk, I'm going to read it to you in its entirety. <laughs> chicken shit minimalism, the illusion of simplicity backed by megabytes of cruft. And of course, this is 1.6 megabytes big. And when I tried to dig into why, why it was so big, not just the 400 uh, kilobytes of JavaScript, but this image, really big, like 900K at the bottom of the page, it wasn't even reachable by scrolling. You had to kind of cave dive down into the footer to find this. I don't know what it is. It's astronauts with tablets and iPhones, but it's there. Why? Why? Here's another example of chicken shit minimalism, the Google contributor page. The idea of Google contributors, you can pay Google a ransom to not show you some ads. Uh, the contributor page is four sentences long, but you have to paginate through like an animal. And at the end of the pagination, on this 1.1 megabyte page, it tells you this is only available in the United States. Some other examples. Here's a poor beer company's website that I will now publicly mock. It is just a giant image and then in the corner, a hamburger menu. Right? You're not gonna solve your web obesity problems and your flabby interface with hamburger menus. They are not the answer. For some reason, design companies really love this approach. This is an even worse example. I don't know if you can even see the tiny three bar hamburger menu on the screen, given the resolution up here. Um, but the greatest example, the one they will put in museums about faux minimalism, is Verge's review of the Apple Watch. How many of you have, I don't know if red is the word for this article, how many of you have attempted to load this article in a browser? <laughs> All right, please don't try it now because you will crash the site internet. What happens is that your scroll event starts doing everything possible. Things coming from the left, things coming from the right, things that you haven't seen since high school call you up and ask how you're doing. Everything <laughs> happens except what you would expect, which is just scrolling through the document. The Apple Watch review is an absolutely useless piece of writing, even though it's probably quite good because it's been, it's, it's been designed to try to look like native uh, iOS behavior plus added transitions and animations. Something happened to designers uh, when the iPad came out. It was some sort of a brain fever that not everybody's recovered from. Here's an example from the uh, uh, wire.co.uk. For some reason, they've decided horizontal is the new vertical and the scroll event is hijacked, so everything goes off to the side, and everything is also in these big squares, except for the tiny navigation on the left. Here's a similar, here's a local page from Baltimore that I found where for some reason it's completely illegible giant infographics. This is captured from a full size screen. Virgin America is really in love with this iPadization of interfaces where you have uh, something that's centered again on a giant screen with, with enormous letters. When I try to book a flight, I have these vast apartment sized text areas that I can fill in, but then tiny writing underneath them. My favorite is the calendar widget, which shows me giant, uh, giant dates and boxes. The one piece of information I want, which is the price on that day, is written tiny script below it. And everything is separated by acres of white space. I should not require sled dogs and pemmican to navigate your visual interface. These giant tundras of white space are doing nothing for me. And where it's particularly painful is in any kind of an information dense interface. Here, for example, is PayPal's old design. I didn't wake up every morning and fall to my knees in gratitude that I could gaze upon PayPal's design yet another day. It didn't do that much for me, but it did let me get my job done. Specifically, it let me sort things by different criteria, it let me see a lot of payments at once, and it was fairly quick. What it's been replaced by is this. The most prominent design element on this page is this nagging empty photo telling me that I haven't shown PayPal what I look like and completed my profile. And then there's basically ads for me to download the app and so on. There's no way to sort. The biggest flaw in the design, of course, is how blurry all the information is. I can hardly read it. <laughs> um, so these interfaces, I feel like I shouldn't, you know, every information product I interact with shouldn't be designed for someone sitting on a public toilet, bored, just going through their phone. It's okay to have something information dense for when I need to get work done. 
There's a trigger alert. I'm about to show you a screenshot of a Google Reader screen. I apologize if that hurts you. But again, if you remember, the old Google Reader design was horrible, but everything was packed together and was very effective. You could read stuff quickly. Google did a site-wide redesign. You see the most prominent interface element here is a subscribe button, something you almost never do once you've set things up. The rarest action gets the most prominent button, and then everything, again, is separated by these vast quantities of white space. This looks more reasonable now than when it came out because other sites have gotten so much worse. But Google is kind of site-wide doing this. This is a... a <laughs> This is a site that lets you control your Google ads. Like, no, you control your Google ads. You're the one serving them. But I went there. I wanted to set my interest up as I'm interested in nothing, and please don't bother me. And you see that after uh, you know, 15 years of observing my behavior, they haven't, they've gotten my age right, but they haven't figured out that I'm a dude. Um, but again, I have to, to set these things. I have to like, hunt for these little treasure troves of text on a vast white field. Here's the Docker homepage that has the same problem. Like, we'll make illegible tabs and then just create vast distances between them. Um, the worst thing is when you, when you see search engines that take this approach, and you have things like one single result and vast buttons when what you really want to see is as much information as possible. Um, and finally, I want to talk about something in responsive design that I don't quite know if to classify as obesity. I think it's a problem, but I, I have no idea what the solution is or whether it's been articulated. So please tell me if it's been articulated. But the issue is that while I'm sympathetic to the idea that things should change and rearrange and move around as screens get smaller and bigger, we haven't solved the problem that when we're on the phone and iPad, we have these big meat styluses hanging off of our hands, and that's our interface device, I'm just slapping the screen with them. Whereas when we're on a desktop, we have a pointer. And this is about to get more complicated because Apple's introduced the pencil. So if that stylus-like thing catches on, we'll have these situations where we have different screen sizes and uh, fine motor control or just drunken slapping of the interface, and we have to adjust both. So here's a recipe site, and these poor people are caught between two fires. On the one hand, you have way too much gaps between stuff, tiny text and fonts. On the other hand, you have things like that orange on button that's underneath the, the picture of the biscuits a little bit, things that you can tap that have hearts on them that you like something. It, it's an it's a interface at war with itself uh, because it doesn't quite know what width is the right width. And of course, a hamburger menu because it's, I believe, now required by law. Here's a, <laughs> here's a Forbes page with the menu clicked open. You see another uh, interface at war with itself. I don't even know what's going on here, and I stared at this for a while. I tried clicking on Some things have up arrows, left arrows, right arrows. There's all sorts of multiple places where you can tweet this important piece of information. There's this expandable menu that's somehow open but has its very own scroll bar, and I'm not sure what happens if I scroll it. And then just to cap it all off, there's this giant banner ad with its entire own idea of how big it should be and you know, stealing attention from everything else on the page. I'm going to change tack before I offend everybody in the audience. I want to talk about heavy clouds. So I have a friend who makes biscuits for a living. She's very good at it, and like a lot of home bakers, she started off making everything in her kitchen. Very soon discovered that it was going to drive her crazy. It was constantly hot, her oven was basically breaking, and at some point she had to bite the bullet and go buy some piece of professional restaurant equipment. An oven, let's say. Now, if you're very good at baking biscuits, that doesn't mean you're any good at picking out this equipment, installing it, knowing how to use it, knowing how to negotiate the price, but that's what she was stuck with. For a long time, as developers, we were stuck with the same problem. If we wanted to have a website and it got big enough in scale, we were forced to at some point procure hardware for it, install it somewhere, and negotiate the prices, until the cloud came along. The cloud was this amazing innovation by Amazon that said that you can rent this stuff basically by the hour. If you want storage, have as much as you want. If you want fancy equipment, have as much as you want. Computers as big as, 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 as we can make them. All of this can be yours. And this was genuinely revolutionary. Suddenly, if you had a success, you could rent a vat or whatever it is you needed, and you could you know, feed a, a multitude instead of just 10 people that you thought were coming to dinner and do it all on the fly. However, it came with a caveat. And Amazon was very upfront about this. So it said, even though you can rent as much equipment, as much kitchen space as you need, the handles on the frying pans are pretty flimsy. And the ovens might break. We guarantee certain things. So Amazon might guarantee that the freezer would never thaw 
Never ever, no matter what, the freezer will remain below freezing. But it's possible that the door will be stuck for hours at a time. So when you plan your cooking accordingly, make sure you factor this in. This isn't skullduggery on Amazon's part. This is the nature of distributed systems. But it forced people to think in a different way. And unfortunately, it's a way that is extremely enticing to the programmer mind. It forced people to build distributed systems. Now, building websites is a little bit dull. You have some content in a database, and you need to hook it up to a template and serve it. It's very important work, but it doesn't fire the imagination. Building distributed systems. All right? It's like if you went to your accountant who does your taxes normally and said, I'd like you to investigate tax shelters in the Seychelles, and here's a ticket, fly out there, see what you can find out with the main banks. You know, a dream come true, like something to engage your mind, fun to work on. So it didn't make things any better when Amazon started offering more automation. So now this kitchen had robots that would do certain tasks for you. You could program them to, to slice and dice. What's more fun, cutting an onion or programming a robot to cut the onion for you? you know, it's a lot, lot more fun when you're a developer. And Amazon keeps introducing more and more layers of this. Also, companies like Google and Facebook are working on open source projects for managing their truly enormous data centers that then percolate down. And people love to play with this stuff. I love to play with this stuff. It's cool. As I've said, complexity is a bug lamp for smart people. We're just drawn to it. And the same thing happens on the front end as it does on the back end. As soon as these computers become fast enough to really run layers and layers of virtualization software on, then we start putting layers of software on and playing with that. As soon as the browsers become fast enough to render anything you want and JavaScript becomes standards compliant and fast, well, then we build our own templating systems in them. It's, it's the human condition. So we end up with a lot of this sort of stuff, terrible cloud overkill. Here's an example from, I want to make sure I, I quote the man's name correctly. Wow, I've really blown through this talk. I believe the man's name is Adam Crane. He basically wrote a blog post about Hadoop and big data manipulation. Someone had enthusiastically written a tutorial about how to analyze chess games with Hadoop, which is one of these things that you use data centers in order to process tons and tons and tons of information. Uh, and he pointed out that for this size of data set, it was actually 235 times faster to just use a shell script if you wrote it correctly. Uh, this happens over and over again. The, the cloud thinking kind of colors your sense of what can be done and what can't be done. It's not because these people are dumb and they don't know that computers are capable. It's just that when you've spent enough time with all these virtualization layers between you and actual hardware, you don't realize how much more effective it has gotten. I'll give you an example from my own recent past. I run a bookmarking site called Pinboard. I recently heard from a competitor, we'll call them Acme, uh, and uh, Acme is in a bit of a pickle. We had a, a negotiation about possibly buying Acme, and they told me that you know, I have uh, 8,000 daily users saving bookmarks, they have 3,000. It's about the same, I could handle that. Uh, we both have half an employee. I dither away my time and I travel the world giving talks. They have an intern working half time on the site. We both make some money from it. I make about $12,000 a month. They make about 5,000, which per user is, is, translates to roughly the same. And then we got to the hosting bill. And they told me they were paying $23,000 a month because they're on the cloud. They have God knows how many dozens of servers on Amazon Web Services. But through heroic effort, they had gotten the hosting bill down to $9,000 a month. So from my perspective, bookmarking is a lucrative business that lets me stay self-employed. I make about $11,000 a month from it. From their perspective, it's a terrible money loser. What I'm saying is that complexity anchors your thinking. If you think you need a giant tool chain to produce a website, then you're going to only produce websites that you can make with these giant tool chains. Or if your boss thinks that, it's even worse because you can't persuade them otherwise. Similarly, if you think that you have to have systems that can operate at scale, then you're only ever going to try to build those systems. People kind of compare their stacks, right? <laughs> like, what's in your stack? Oh, you know, my stack's got all these pieces of software. I, I have this incredibly uh, inefficient workflow. I think, to me, <laughs> stack is a word like polyfill. If you use either one of those words, it's a glaring red light that something's gone terribly wrong in the way that you think about the web, all right? Reflect, you've made a horrible mistake. I see 
I see all this happening, and no matter what we say about web load, like, it never gets fixed. So I'm going to try to motivate you with what motivates me. I think there are two futures possible for the web. The first one I envision is the Minecraft future, where the web is kind of, it's kind of blocky. It's never going to be very pretty. Uh, but the purpose of it is to make stuff, make cool stuff, make stuff with other people, be inventive, play. There's no real set predefined goals except for a very basic set of building blocks. And you can do astonishing things. Here's a city made in Minecraft. My favorite, of course, is a CPU, a working CPU with redstone that who knows who the people are that made this, but it is an incredible achievement. So a playful and fundamentally like contributory web where you're expected to pitch in and do something neat with it. You can hack on the pieces if you have the technical expertise, but the fun is at the, at the next level up versus this idea of the web as Call of Duty. The web is being beautifully produced, requiring an enormous number of people, something that you can never get your head around because there's too many distinct layers, something with long pipelines, something that somehow looks the same even though it's really beautiful, but every one of these games is dark brown and resembles, resembles the others, something that encodes a, a very imperialist and troubling view of the world and you can't quite object to within the game, you can only not participate in. So, I've, this is the serious part of my talk, so you can't be laughing now, because we're gonna get hortatory, right? Let me get to the hortatory H section. So I think the most important thing, as, as somebody who is here in Australia, because you flew me across the ocean, because in 1999 I happened to blunder into learning how to do HTML by viewing source, I think it's important to get as many people participating in the web as possible, to get tools that make it easier to participate in the web. You don't have to become a full-fledged coder or programmer, but it should just be possible for, one another, for all of us to learn from each other's code without, uh, without having to take special lessons to be able to peek under the hood we should have tools that make it as easy to get online with your own stuff on your own servers as it is to get online on Dropbox or Facebook, these sites that are kind of uh, the AOL of, of, of the present. They're trying to encapsulate the web and have all, the, all of people's interactions happen within them. I want us to commit to the idea that as computers get faster and as networks get faster, the web should get faster. I want us not to panic when the dinosaurs of online publishing try to trample us while they're stampeding away from the meteor. We just have to hide in our holes and wait for them to pass and nature to take its course. They're all going to go onto Facebook and Google and try to sell their articles there. That's normal. It's our job to create a cool web outside of that. And most importantly, let's break the back of the surveillance establishment, the one that threatens not just our livelihood but our liberty. Here in Australia and in America and in the UK, all of these free countries where even 10 years ago the thought that we would be under constant surveillance commercially and by our governments would have sounded like crappy science fiction. We have the power to change it by doing our own thing, by being independent and by making websites with each other and for another. We just have to stand together. Thank you so much.